Five and a half after eight o'clock, Jerry Williams is next. Hello, America. This is Jerry Williams. I'll be with you until midnight tonight. We'll be talking to a guest in a moment, and we'll be, of course, soliciting your comments, your views, your ideas, your thoughts and opinions here on WBZ Radio. Uh, most of what's on the public's mind today, I suspect, is uh, that of how do I exist, how do I cope, uh, how do you deal with inflation and recession at the same time? And we've talked to many people about the problems of the economy, uh, the problems of uh, money. Uh, I think we do more uh, programs here on financial and fiscal matters than anybody else in the country. And we talk to different people with varied views on the subject. And tonight, we're going to meet uh, Colonel Edward Harwood, um, who was in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and as Director Emeritus of the American Institute for Economic Research, which was founded back in 1933. Colonel Harwood is on the line with us tonight. How are you, Colonel? Hello? Yes? Yes, I didn't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, because I didn't throw the right switch, which starts us off oh. on the right foot. Well, I'm fine, thank you. Good, it's nice to talk to you. Yeah. Maybe you can tell people a little background about the American Institute for Economic Research, and then some background on yourself as well. The Institute was started in December 1933, and uh, in 1934 it began carrying on its economic research, and as a way of raising funds for it, it began giving advice on investments. That advisory work was continued along with its uh, economic research for several years until the Internal Revenue Service finally thought that the investment advisory work was a business. And so that was changed to another organization, American Institute Counselors Incorporated, which is a taxable organization in order that the American Institute for Economic Research might uh, regain its tax exemption. However, AIC is not a uh, corporation such as a stock corporation. Uh, there are no shares. It is also a Section 180 or charitable and educational organization and its profits after taxes all go to American Institute for Economic Research. Now, the Institute has continued and developed and there's now more than, many more than a million people have purchased its publications and more than 30,000 subscribers are getting the publications of the two organizations weekly and bi-weekly. As for my personal background, I I uh, volunteered for World War I, but uh, happily served at West Point where I didn't get shot at. And I continued in the regular Army Corps of Engineers until 37. After a few years after I had started the Institute, I retired, but uh, in 1940 I volunteered to return to active service because World War II was on the horizon. I retired at the end of World War II after 26 and a half years of military service. and. Uh, returned to continue with the Institute. When Korea broke, I volunteered for that, but they told me I was too old. So that's the brief summary of my military background. I've been writing in the field of economics. This is the beginning of my 53rd year. What inspired you to do that in the first place? That's rather difficult for me to say. Looking back, I became interested in economics when I was on duty as a graduate student in the Corps of Engineers at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and started reading and within a year or so was writing articles that people wanted to publish and you know there's nothing more encouraging to a young writer than to finding that people want to pay him for what he writes. So <laughs> well I wonder whether or not uh, the, uh, you might have been interested in political affairs and whether you thought the country was heading into the wrong direction at a particular point in, uh, during your lifetime, and that got you interested in m money matters and financial matters and fiscal matters, or whether or not you were just p plain interested, that's all. Well, it started by being plain interested, but by the late 20s, 26, 27, 28, I'd become very much concerned about the increasing inflating of largely of private credit at that time, and some of my articles uh, described what we were confronted with, 
In fact, if the uh, man who built this palatial mansion that we purchased after World War II had been reading my articles at that time, I guess he'd be here today and we wouldn't. But we foresaw the uh, uh, 1929 crash and the Depression, and uh, it was as a result of the uh, attempts that were made at that time to cope with the Depression, which I felt sure were ill-advised. That was a strong factor in starting American Institute for Economic Research. You mean the uh, the social legislation of the Roosevelt period is something that uh, got you further interested? Is that what you're saying? Well, that and the ideas, the Keynesian ideas, which uh, became popular and started the spend for prosperity notions and so on. Uh huh. And uh, that, uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, with respect to your economic views, uh, began this whole thrust into uh, uh, your ideas on the economy. I know that you have fans all over because I've been getting calls all day saying, when will Colonel Harwood be on? Yes. So uh, you have a great many of your people listening tonight, I'm sure, but I'm trying to introduce you to new people with new ideas on this. And uh, where are we now, um, uh, Colonel Harwood? Uh, what do you think of where we're headed now with inflation, recession? Oil prices heading upward with um, a, a sort of laissez-faire government in, um, in Washington, at, at least compared with former Democrats. Where do you think we're all headed now? That is the, I suppose you'd call it the $64 question. Uh, we don't know any way to predict the short-term trends, even the business cycle trends, other than the uh, work of the National Bureau, which is now published regularly by the federal government in the form of the statistical indicators. As far as we've been able to discover, that's the best way of getting some understanding of what may be going to occur in business trends in the near future. Uh, right now, things look better than they did a few months ago. That is to say, the leading indicators have turned up, or appear to have, a majority of them. And unless one of them backslides shortly, uh, that should be a favorable omen for business in the immediate future. However, we do not see how there could be more than a relatively short cyclical recovery because the excesses of the past are hanging over us in the form of unliquidated debts and many other complications. Uh, since the Roosevelt period into World War I, into Korea, uh, I'm not trying to string all the wars together, but I guess it's since uh, 1945, this country, however has enjoyed uh, fantastic progress, uh, technological progress. Uh, in the last uh, 50 years, we've uh, gone from a propeller, small propeller airplane to rockets on the moon. I mean, th this uh, country has progressed, it seems, to most people anyway, in transportation, in roads, and many things. Uh, we have our problems, but don't you think that um, uh, the uh, presidents of the past and the economics of the past have contributed to this progress, or do you think that it's all heading us into a disaster? Well, I think in the first place, to answer the last part first, Fine. there is no question that we are heading into a disaster. The only doubt at the moment is whether the disaster will be postponed a couple of years by an abortive cyclical recovery before inflating is resumed. We are far down the same path that Great Britain has gone. They're perhaps a few years ahead of us, but we're going in the same direction. I would not say that all the efforts of the presidents of the past have been wasted, and I'm sure that their intentions were for the best, but you know they say hell is paved with good intentions, and I'm afraid we have some rather difficult times ahead. Well, what do you think they've done wrong? What are the presidents of the past when, um, I will have to take it, I guess, from the last, uh, since 1940, which gives us a good 35-year span. Uh, what have they done wrong uh, that, that, you, uh, uh, that you do not put your stamp of approval on? Uh, basically, they have accepted the Keynesian ideas, which have come to dominate much of academic teaching, of course. Those ideas are based on what can probably be called secular revelations rather than on scientific inquiry. And unfortunately, those ideas are leading, are resulting in moving the world toward a great financial disaster. I should think that that would be evident to many people mm -hmm. in view of what has happened in the last few years. And we certainly see signs of it around the, the world, there's no doubt about that. Yes. Uh, now, uh, what have you done to protect yourself over these periods? I'm sure you've adopted this philosophy some many years back, 
So it's nothing new. You're preaching the, the gospel as you understand it for many years. Am I right? Yes. You haven't changed your view. So what, what have you done? Uh, what have you advised the folks who read your literature at the American Institute for Economic Research? What have you advised them to do? Well, I'll give you a very quick summary. First, in the 1937-38 period, when the railroads were nearly all bankrupt and the bonds were going begging at 8 at $10 on the $100 bond with interest accrued, we were recommending them, and they paid off handsomely within several years. Then, after World War II, when everybody said that the utilities would not be able to uh, cope with inflating, we recommended the utilities because we became convinced they were coping with them, and that proved to be very profitable indeed for about uh, 15 years, something like that. And then we have recommended other types of securities. But in 1965, we reduced greatly our recommendations of American common stocks, and since then have discontinued recommending any securities, any American common stocks, or any securities den denominated in any currency of the world. We originally started recommending gold stocks in 1958. There were developments at that time that convinced us that the U.S. government would not attempt to save the dollar, that it would uh, eventually close the gold window and let the dollar go, as it has. And uh, interestingly enough, the gold stocks that we recommended in 1958 uh, worked out better during the next uh, seven years than the Dow Jones averages. That may be very surprising to a number of people. And then, of course, since then, we had uh, greatly increased the proportion invested in gold stocks, uh, with the result that uh, in very recent years, the last three or four, uh, those who have followed our advice have not only protected their capital, they have, of course, made great profits. I'm going to take a short break. Colonel Edward Harwood is with us. He's in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and Director Emeritus of the American Institute for Economic Research. Many millions of people have read uh, this material. And uh, we're always interested in hearing other views, new views on uh, the subject. Colonel Harwood's uh, views are, have been uh, there for some time, so we're seeking them out. We'll be taking your calls and comments in a little bit. Here's Peter Sellers now for TWA. Flying around the states doing business can be mighty rough. You know, push, push, shove, shove. That's why I fly TWA. Their new Trans World Service helps me forget business, even when I'm flying on business. <laughs> It's one business luxury that you don't have to give up. For starters, you get a contoured coach seat that helps your body unwind. You also get great continental cuisine like beef charon. And for standard charging coach, you've got imported wines. TWA also has titillating foreign movie classics. So when you fly in the States on business, have your travel agent put you on TWA. Trans World Service doesn't cost you a penny more. And it gives a businessman the greatest lift since Wingtip Shoot. <laughs> Only TWA gives you a choice of movies on nonstop to Los Angeles and San Francisco. Call your travel agent for information and reservations on TWA's Trans World Service flights. This commercial is calculated to reach you in the middle of a traffic jam with a temperature up around 90 degrees and the perspiration rolling down your brow and your clothes sticking to your body. Come on, buddy, let's move it. If this sounds move anything it. like you, you'll be happy to hear that right now, at all Eastern Massachusetts American Motors dealers, the 1975 Matador comes with factory-installed air conditioning, free. I'll say it again. The Matador comes with free air conditioning right now. Oh, if you happen not to want free air conditioning, your AMC dealer will take the equivalent value right off the sticker price. That's worth about $450. Of course, why anybody would not want free air, I don't know. Come on, buddy, I'm in a hurry. There's a very interesting ad on page 172B in the July Reader's Digest. Tilly Lewis Foods, the packer of those marvelous and delicious tasty diet foods, will donate a big part of their advertising money to the American Diabetes Association to help fight diabetes. Too few people realize diabetes is near the top of the dreaded disease list. Millions of Americans have it, so it is a very big problem. Let's all help. Save the Tasty Diet labels from any Tasty Diet product. 
and send them to Tasty Diet in Stockton, California. The address is on the label. For every label sent in, Tasty Diet will donate five cents to the American Diabetes Association. Help find a cure for the dreadful diabetes. You'll even find postage-free mailers for sending in the labels at your grocers. Let's return now to Colonel Edward Harwood of the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Uh, Colonel Harwood, uh, are, you, is, are you just advising for your people gold stocks? Is that it? Uh, g- gold stocks and gold, go- that is to say gold and gold-related assets for the most part. Of course, we make a distinction between advice for people who are retired and people who are still in the working years. For people who are about to retire, we have recommended, uh, say, 30% in Swiss annuities. And surprising enough, for many people, the return from Swiss annuities, people who bought them three or four years ago, has increased 70% because the dollar has fallen so far in terms of the Swiss franc. In other words, the annuities were payable in francs, and they get more and more dollars uh, returned for them. We had believed that that probably would occur, and it has occurred, and it probably will occur to a greater extent in the future, although there may be variations, of course. Then uh, perhaps 30% or so in uh, gold stocks, and uh, another 30% possibly in uh, metric accounting unit survival contracts or in what we call sovereign contracts. But basically the person would be uh, protected to a great extent by being in gold or gold-related assets. Obviously you've uh, followed your own advice, I hope. Well, to the limited extent that I felt that I wanted to, I long ago placed my own funds, which were then quite small, in what is ordinarily called a blind trust. And I have no control over it, and uh, I don't even have the right to know what's in it. But I have every reason to believe that it's been well managed. Well, since 1958, you've been advising gold stocks, so obviously by uh, this year, and uh, through the so-called gold boom, I guess you could call it a gold boom, uh, but you're, the people who have followed your advice obviously have made money. Have they made fortunes, would you say? Well, I don't like to put it that way, because... Uh, too many people might misunderstand and think that all they had to do was write us and get a fortune. But I, I know I, I, anywhere I go in this country, or in fact abroad where I run across Americans, I am always receiving very effusive thanks for what we've been able to do for them. So, And uh, you have not changed your mind about the future. You feel that um, uh, still the government is the government of the, the, the problem, the government and the way the government handles the dollar and the economy and uh, uh, the, uh, the whole business of uh, uh, government getting into everything is, is the culprit? That, that's uh, a primary part of it, yes. You see, we have established, I think you can dis- only describe it as a self-destruct mechanism. Our Social Security provisions, for example, and of course, we strongly believe that the Social Security benefits should be assured, much better assured than they are now. But the Social Security system as it is now set up is really a self-destruct mechanism because it uh, provides for increasing benefits at greatly increasing tax costs to the younger people on whom we're counting to have the children, to have the next generation after them. Now, uh, that has created a financial squeeze for the younger families, together with the inflating, of course. Many people do not realize that, oh, at least half of the workers in this country, their wages have not kept up with the rise in prices, that they are being unmercifully squeezed by this whole performance. Well, anyway, the net result is one of the most surprising things that's happened since the Black Death of the 12 and 1300s, and that is this, in the past, 15 years, while the number of women reaching childbearing age has increased 65%, the number of births has dropped 30%. Now, there has never been anything like that in the history of the world to date that we know of, with the possible exception of during the catastrophic years of the plague of the Black Death in Europe in the 12 and 1300s. Uh, There was 
during the Great Depression in this country a, uh, an increase of about 10% in uh, women reaching childbearing age, uh, accompanied by a 10, 10% decrease in the number of births, which uh, was quite clearly attributable to the depression difficulties and the financial squeeze on the families and so on. This time we have a great accentuation of that from the uh, financial mechanisms, so to speak, that have been set up and that are now operating. And this country is actually faced with a decreasing population in the very distant future unless something is done to remedy the situation. And as you know, we now already have quite a severe recession. Some call it a depression. And the effects of that on the birth rate may be similar to those of the 1930s, in which event this drop in birth will continue even further. Now, the net effect of that, in not too many years, uh, I'm old enough to take a little perspective. This is my 75th year, and I'm willing to look ahead 30, 40, 50 years. But by that time, the people paying Social Security benefits will have to give up 70 or 80 percent of their salaries to pay the benefits, which of course is ridiculous. We know that can't be done. There are too many other things that money is needed for. Now, we already have shortages in the Social Security benefit funds. They're already facing that problem, and that's going to get worse and worse and worse. The government is going to be simply desperate. That is to say, the politicians are going to be desperate. So. The outlook is not good in that respect. Well, uh, Colonel Harwood, if, if you were to wave the magic wand, if that were possible, to change the system uh, to uh, a system that you think would work, what would it look like? What kind of a system would it be? Well, you know, that, that's a rather difficult question to answer, but since you've asked it, I'll do my best. First, I would take off all restrictions on contracting in terms of gold. Many people don't remember that much of the Western world, including the United States, had a gold accounting unit all during, well, for many years. And that gold accounting unit had a stability. It made it possible to avoid the continued inflating that we have had in the last 30 years. So I think the first thing to do is to return to the American people their basic constitutional right to make contracts in terms of gold to the extent that they choose to do so. I think we have not only a constitutional right, but an old established common law right to make contracts and write into them whatever we wish to have the payment made in. And possibly if that were done, more and more people, businesses and so on, would decide they wanted their contracts in terms either of gold directly or of gold-related currencies. And in that event, there could be a beginning of a return towards sound money. Let me make clear that I don't think there's any possibility of achieving a multinational agreement on a return to sound money. Uh, they've been trying for several years now with the Committee of 20 of the IMF come up with some plan that could be agreed upon, and the more they talk, the more hopeless it is. It just in, in, isn't in the cards, and I'm quite sure that even within the United States, there is no possibility that you'd get the various economists and uh, others to agree on just how we should return to sound money. I think the only way we're going to be able to do it is to set the people free, let them choose what they wish to do, and let those who wish write contracts in gold, and I think we would see a gradual return, an evolutionary return, to sound money and sound commercial banking. That is one part of the picture. What would the government look like? Would, they be, would there be Social Security under your, uh, uh, your ideas? Would there be a welfare system? Uh, would there be um, a national health system? How would that function under uh, the, uh, the eyes of a Colonel Harwood? Well, let's start with the Social Security system. I think the payments there should be properly assured. They are not now. No pension scheme. I don't care what kind of a pension scheme it is, public or private. 
can be considered sound unless it is properly funded. And the Social Security system is not funded, and it's going on the rocks. Many private pension systems are also not funded, and they're getting in a bad condition, too. The railroad pension scheme, I believe, will be is bankrupt unless the government chooses to take care of it, which it probably will. But basically, in my belief, the Social Security system should be turned over to the states in the course of an eight to ten year period, and the Social Security benefits should be transferred with the person wherever he may go, and both Social Security and private uh, benefits and the cash values that are accumulated in the form of investments should be available to anyone who chooses to ask for them. In other words, uh, if a private business you work for is accumulating pensions for you, instead of holding those as a means of uh, keeping you in involuntary servitude, so to speak, that cash value should be available to you if you choose to leave that business or go somewhere else. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, Colonel, I'm going to break for just a moment, and then we'll come back and continue with Colonel Edward Harwood, Director Emeritus of the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, founded back in 1933, right here on the spirit of New England, WBZ Boston. Group W Westinghouse Broadcasting. Have happy, happy fun every day and night at Canopy Lake Park, a family fun festival with thrilling free circus acts, kiddie rides, adult rides, fun games, penny arcades, giant swimming pool, cruises on the lake, free picnicking, free parking every day and night at Canopy Lake Park, Salem, New Hampshire. And there's a special free attraction this Sunday, zooming exciting championship outboard hydroplane races for championship prizes. Fun and rides for every age at Canopy Lake Park, Salem, New Hampshire, every day and night. Gates open 10 a.m., rides at noon. Joe Giliotti didn't get to be a top sports writer in Boston just playing sandlot ball in the Reporters League. He's covered gangland wars, murders, presidents, air and sea disasters, even tracked down exclusives that won him national recognition. So when he directs that cool efficiency to sports, you're reading one of the best there is. Joe Giliotti in the Boston Herald American. Call 426-3000 and work out with a pro every morning. Giliotti in the Herald American. He'll pitch it to you right over the plate. Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, Orlando. Name the city you'd like to visit in Florida and Eastern Airlines has a flight for you. Non-stop Eastern flights leave Boston every day for Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, St. Petersburg, and Orlando, the home of Walt Disney World. But if you're not going to one of these cities, you've still got a reason to call Eastern, because Eastern also has through and connecting service to nine other Florida cities. And to most of these Florida cities, you can save 25% off the regular day coach airfare with Eastern's discount fares. For ticket purchase and travel requirements on these special 25% off fares, call Eastern or your travel agent. If you're planning to travel beyond Florida to the Caribbean, Eastern has daily non-stop service to San Juan and convenient connecting service throughout the Caribbean. For reservations to Florida or the Caribbean, call the travel specialist, your travel agent, or call Eastern, the wings of man. There's an old saying that money does not grow on trees. Well, at acres and acres, they're out to disprove that old adage, money does grow on trees when those trees grow on land that appreciates in value year after year after year. Whether you're looking for investment, vacation, recreation, or retirement, they have the ideal spot for you only one and a half hours from Boston. This is really choice land, too. Complete with ponds and brooks and rolling hills and panoramic views, nestled amid the lakes region of southeastern New Hampshire. And for as little as $1,500 down toward a total of $4,750, you and your family can begin your escape from the asphalt jungle to your own five-acre world of swimming, boating, fishing, hiking, or whatever else you feel like doing. That's only about 95 cents a tree. Acres and Acres even offers easy finance plans. Now, if you want further information, write to Acres and Acres, WBZ Radio, Boston 02134, or day or night, call now. 475-6797. That's 475-6797 or write to Acres and Acres, WBZ Radio, Boston, 02134. Now let's return to Colonel Edward Harwood, Director Emeritus of the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. We have the uh, 
uh, Colonel's uh, attitudes now on Social Security. What about all of the other programs that the government is now into? Do you Are you a um, laissez-faireist, so to speak, Colonel Harwood? Would they be abolished under uh, the system that you envision? Well, I think I would like to see the federal government not giving aid or making charitable contributions to benefit either citizens or foreigners, except as follows. In time of war or other times in direct preparation for the national defense, then I think Congress should or may authorize such aid to actual allies as is deemed in the best interest of the United States. In times of a serious disaster, Congress might extend aid through the International Red Cross or something like that. The federal government, I don't believe, should interfere with private charity in any way if people wish to give to foreigners or any governments or citizens as far as that goes. Of course, I do not believe that the exemption from gift taxes should be allowed for gifts to foreign governments and agencies. But And I think that... Uh, Unless it was uh, deemed necessary by Congress to prevent the supplying of armament and strategic materials directly or indirectly to nations at war with or about enemies of the United States, there should be no restrictions. In other words, the federal government, as it was originally conceived, was intended to be a limited government. And I don't think it's possible to operate a government uh, soundly at the high level of our federal government with it trying to do everything that it is trying to do. I think it becomes an impossibility and that it has created just an immense uh, nest of bureaus and bureaucracies, uh, some of which work in conflict with one another and some of which are interfering with free market adjustments, creating emergencies. I think the oil, oil situation is one example where an emergency has arisen in large part because of government intervention, uh, which has prevented the orderly operation of free markets. That's a very brief summary of the picture. Well, I how, think how would you prevent, uh, for instance, in California, I think it was about two weeks ago, 11 major oil companies have been indicted for conspiring to fix prices under your system. How would one deal with a situation like that? Let's say the free market system didn't operate, and 11 oil companies did, in fact, conspire. Well, we've uh, long had laws against those, and we didn't need a commission preventing the development of new natural gas resources in order to bring those people up for trial. In what? other words, um, we have plenty of ways under the common law, our heritage of common law is intended to provide protection against fraud and uh, theft and uh, monopolies that take undue advantage and things like that. So I think that the, the, the people could be protected, could protect themselves against that sort of thing through the courts without the necessity of having all the uh, great numbers of regulatory commissions and bodies of one kind or another. Now, is it possible to separate your economic views from your social and political views, or are they all intertwined? I would say that my views are primarily based on uh, economic practicalities. Uh, I don't think that uh, I'm a hard-hearted uh, person who has no sympathy for the underdog. Quite the contrary. I'm uh, very much inclined to believe that we have established too many ways in which special privileges are granted. And we forget that special privileges are granted always at the expense of somebody who loses some of his uh, privileges. For example, when we uh, give away to favored individuals the right to use the airways that we happen to be using here tonight, when we give those away to favored people without the government collecting any uh, annual rental for the privilege, the, whoever gets that special privilege is just handed something on a silver platter. and. Uh, uh, we forget that that's handed at the expense of other people in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you rectify that? I would say that any grant of a special privilege of any kind should be by competitive bidding and either on an annual rental fee basis or capital sum basis or whatever proved to be practicable in the long run. Mm -hmm. And sums received 
from those special privileges uh, could reduce everybody's taxes, make it a better place to live and work. Well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Well, I think so. Uh, let me ask you the uh, final question before we take some calls from folks at home at 254-5678, by the way, if you'd like to talk to Colonel Harwood. Uh, the uh, question has to do with um, your, your, your predictions for the future. Uh, do you think there's any hope? I'm, I'm, I, uh, when, I, when I hear your, your views on the social and political systems that you envision, it seems to me that this uh, federal bureaucracy is ever rolling on as our state bureaucracies. And I see some rollback in the city bureaucracies because of the tension, uh, fiscal tension in various cities around the country. Uh, but do you think there's any hope for ever coming to where you uh, uh, envision the system, or uh, maybe you can make some predictions for the future for us as well, so that we're prepared? Well, I think perhaps I can answer in this way, that we are definitely coming to very difficult times. I cannot say how soon. Don't you think we're in those difficult times? Well, we're in the beginning of them, uh -huh. put it that way. We may get an alleviation for a year or two or three, but then we'll be in worse times. And we have very great problems. And I am optimistic enough to believe that under the pressure of real problems, that we may have a sort of a re-education of our people and a realization of some of what has gone wrong. Uh, basically, I'm an optimist, you see, because here I spent my life really trying to educate people on these matters. And I either must be a very foolish and silly, or I'm a it would seem to me it would take really a social revolution of sorts uh, to bring about uh, the system as you see it uh, because of uh, uh, the government being involved in defense contracts and <clears throat> pardon me all the defense contractors being involved with the government that the government is in effect a partner of everybody in the country be they in the private industry or be they on welfare uh, that well, I don't uh, think that we'd, I don't think you'd have to stop the national defense. In fact, one of the important changes that I think we should inaugurate is to um, restrict the use of our armed forces to four very definite uses. The first, to rescue American citizens whose lives are endangered abroad, provided such rescue operations are undertaken only when it appears that the citizens can be promptly rescued without a prolonged incursion by U.S. armed forces. And second, to defend the vital interests of the United States when the threat is appropriately recognized by a declaration of war, and only when the Congress declares war. Third, to repel an attack on U.S. armed forces, but not to con undertake a continuing war merely to repel such an attack. And four, to cope with an invasion of the United States. I think if we restricted the use of our armed forces in that way, it would have a very great influence on our foreign policy. I think we might not get uh, bogged down in things such as Vietnam, for example. We might not be in the position of sending our young men to sacrifice their lives without adequate support. I agree 100% with General MacArthur that in the war there is no substitute for victory, and I think we have no moral right to send young men of this country to a war unless we are willing to back them up with everything we've got. And your predictions for the immediate future are um, pessimistic? I'm afraid so. And uh, for the average fellow, uh, back to gold stocks again, or gold, uh, do, you adver uh, do you advise uh, gold bullion by any chance? Oh, yes. Yes? Gold bullion and gold coins, low mm -hmm. premium gold coins. Is that the only um, uh, metal of substance that you're advising? How about platinum? No. No. We wouldn't advise most people to play with platinum. Silver? Well, we are not advising it. We did advise it when it was 90 cents, and we recommended that people get out of it uh, when it went over 225. It's now four dollars and something. But uh, we feel that in the event of a major depression, that uh, silver may uh, be adversely affected, much more so than gold. What is uh, today's gold price, uh, Colonel Harwood? 162, I think 75 is the second fixing. Where will it be in 1978, do you think? <laughs> uh, I would say this, that in general, it will reflect the downward uh, fall of the currencies of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. 
As the currency declines in value, gold will become more valuable. In terms of those currencies. Right, and do you think it'll be at $300 an ounce? Oh, I haven't any idea as to that. I'm sure if we keep on inflating at anything like the rate we are today, it'll be at $300 much sooner than anyone could hope. <laughs> Are you in then in, uh, 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 do you believe in the same thing that Mr. D James Dines believes in? Uh, Mr. Dines' views, I think, uh, parallel yours somewhat economically, anyway. Well, uh, I would say that in many respects his views and mine are parallel. Uh, they differ primarily in that he has greater confidence in uh, his ability to predict relatively short term market movements uh -huh. in various things and uh, seems to me wise. And uh, your um, your views are generally long term and have been that way for some years. Yes. You haven't are. changed you haven't changed your views or are you predicting short term ups and downs? Well there always have been short term ups and downs, you know. Right, I know that, right? So but predicting them is another matter. Right, but I'm saying that your views have not changed, that your views have been constant on this matter. Yeah. as you understand it, and you're not in the business of predicting short-term ups and downs, because if people did follow your advice and started to buy gold stocks in 1958, at what price was it in 1958, the uh, price of an ounce of gold? Well, that was when it was $35, of course. $35. Now at 165 they probably would have made themselves fortunes if they had it to make. Well, I'm going to take a break now, and then we'll return with Colonel Edward Harwood, Director Emeritus of the American Institute for Economic Research, they're in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Many millions of people have read uh, Colonel Harwood's uh, thoughts and theories. And perhaps you'd like to ask any questions. If you do, now's the time to call at 254-5678, area code 617, if you have any questions or comments for Colonel Harwood. We have an open line. If you think good gas mileage has to be imported, we've got news for you. Your New England Ford dealers announced the new Pinto and Mustang II MPGs. New models with up to 34 miles per gallon on official EPA Highway Dynamometer tests. 34 miles per gallon. That's more than most of the foreign imports. But while the mileage has gone up, the prices haven't. The new Pinto MPG is sticker priced less than an imported VW Beetle. The new Mustang MPG is sticker priced less than the best-selling Japanese car. Choose from two Mustang MPG models and three Pinto MPGs. They can all deliver up to 34 miles per gallon, and that's an extra 100 miles per tank full. New Pinto and Mustang MPGs get mileage that is dandy. Miles per gallon to 34, and the low price comes in handy. You don't have to look overseas for good gas mileage. Look to your New England Ford dealer. Sizzles with store-wide savings at Jordan Marsh. Save one-third to one-half on brand names. Women's shoes by Airstep, Caressa, and Cobbies. Junior sportswear from Bronson, Time and Place, College Town, and Bobby Brooks. Save on Mrs. Dresses and Pantsuits by Butte Knit, Jonathan Logan, and Leslie Fay. Sportswear by Catalina, Jansen, Corette, and Villager. A store-wide clearance at Jordan Marsh, of course. Your participating Boston Amico dealer's got bell ringer service at his full service islands. When you drive in a ringer station bell, he'll clean your windshield, offer to check your oil without being asked. He'll give you friendly, courteous bell ringer service every time. So come on in to your participating Boston Amico dealer with the kind of service that will ring your bell. And all you have to do is... At Amoco, we believe in conserving gasoline, not service. Ring our bell. Ring our bell. Ten minutes to nine, Colonel Edward Harwood is with us of the American Institute for Economic Research. Your calls and comments speak up loud and clear. The uh, Colonel is in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. This is Jerry Williams here in Boston on WBZ Radio. Let's begin. Hello. Hello, uh, Jerry. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to talk to the Colonel about uh, free markets. He's listening. Okay. Uh, 
What I'd like to say is a uh, free market is more of a myth than a reality in view of the large amount of cartels and oligopolies in various markets from oil to uh, rubber and also the given stock of natural resources has, has made cartels necessary and uh, these cartels are controlling the supply and also in, uh, controlling the price to feed the demand. And uh, free market is uh, something I don't think we'll ever see going into the year 2000. Colonel Howard? Well, many people have thought that they could uh, control prices and so on and that the free market could be overcome, so to speak. The coffee producers have tried it and many other cartels have been formed from time to time throughout the world, but thus far all have failed. I realize that the uh, Eastern nations oil cartel seems to be especially pr strong, but I personally believe that if we would get out, stop our intervention in the oil market in this country, and uh, I'm not saying by stopping intervention uh, permit cartels to flourish, I'm saying of course enforce the laws against monopoly and so on, but not attempt to regulate so many things as we are trying to regulate, that it wouldn't be very long before any cartel would break down. They have all broken down in the past. But, but historically it's true, but I mean, if you have a given stock of resource, right, which remains earthwise constant, then it's got to be, uh, you know, controlled. In other words, we can't, we're not going to draw anything off the moon, obviously, so we know Earth fairly well at this point, so... What's going to, like, we'll talk oil. I mean, what, what, are the Chinese going to sell us oil, you mean, to balance it out, or? No, you see, I think it's a mistake to assume that we know today all the resources of the Earth. I would say that that is probably the grossest mistake that could possibly be made. Uh, there's oil in many, many places uh, that we haven't explored for yet, I'm sure. Who dreamed that there was oil in the North Sea until just the last few years? No. And shortly England and Western Europe will be independent of the Arabs because of the oil in the North Sea. Who dreamed that there was oil on the North Slope in Alaska uh -huh. until just recently? Now, are we going to say that uh, all of the oil has been discovered? There are no more big fields to be discovered? I think that that... I don't know how anyone can possibly say well, that. Well, I just want case. to interject this one thought. Okay. Buckminster Fuller, the uh, well-known um, futurist, Mr. Fuller indicates that uh, uh, the oil, uh, fossil fuels, are the thing of the past, that uh, we'll have other energy and other fuels, and we'll be taking most of our energy from the sun and other places, and that fossil fuels will be um, are, are really just the beginning of a technology which we haven't even been able to comprehend or understand, so that oil will disappear as a, um, you know, major source of our energy needs, uh, perhaps in the next 20 or 25 years. Well, I'd like to say, Jerry, how do you explain that to someone who owns a, a 74 Buick? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. Colonel Harwood, any comment on that? Well, I would only comment to this extent that uh, he may be right in his predictions, but I don't think anybody's going to monopolize. Now, I have, I have one more question, okay? Well, and that is, I, I, I dabbled in economics myself. We have MVPT, right? The stock of money and velocity equals oh, price well, times would transaction. Would you like to talk about that? What? Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, a little bit in the sense that if, if you reduce it all down to gold, you have, I mean, again, a given amount of stock, and you, you know, and you, uh, you shrink all this paper, and then the transactional shrink, and then your GNP, uh, you know, everything else will fall in line, and, and, and I, I, it could be a nightmare, a disaster, internationally. Uh, I realize that many people have the fears that you express, right. and that's why I suggest that there will never be developed a universal agreement among nations or even within our own nation what to do. And so I say, just set people free. Let them do what they choose to do as far as gold is concerned. Leave them alone. Yeah. See what I happens. All right, thank you very much. We want to get into another call before the 9 o'clock news break for Colonel Edward Harwood of the American Institute for Economic Research on WBZ. Hello. Yes, uh, Jerry, I'd like to uh, ask Colonel Harwood a question concerning uh, his opinions as far as the new revised Keogh plan. I'm a uh, manufacturer's representative. I represent three companies in the apparel industry, and, of course, I have no pension. 
and I was wondering what his feeling was as far as the security of this uh, program for the future. Well, I think I'd have to ask you, whom are you going to trust to invest the money for you? Well, uh, I would probably do it through a, uh, I was thinking of th doing it through a savings bank. Well, if you can find a bank that will invest in gold stocks, you do better than most people can. I know of one that has done that with great success, but most banks sneer at the idea. In fact, most bankers were so far away from gold as money that most bankers don't even know that gold was money. Uh-huh. Well, my, my real question is, uh, do you feel that I'd be better taking that money, even though it is tax-free, and uh, just putting that into gold or gold stocks and, and just forget about that type of a uh, pension plan? I think I'd answer that this way, that for the time being, until the rate of inflating and therefore the rise in prices becomes very rapid, you'd probably better take advantage of the tax deduction if you're in a high tax bracket. Yeah. Okay, that was that was more or less my feeling, but I was just wondering what uh, your thoughts were on that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short break. We have news upcoming. Colonel Edward Harwood is with us, in case you missed our earlier discussion. Colonel Harwood is with the American Institute for Economic Research. He's the director emeritus. Uh, this group founded back in 1933. Many millions of people have already uh, read his material. And we've had many, many requests from people all over the country to have uh, Colonel Harwood on with us to explain his theories and ideas. And we're now taking your questions and comments at 254-5678 here on WBZ Radio. So we will take this short intermission, news and weather, and then we'll return with Colonel Harwood and your questions. The Spirit of New England, WBZ Boston, Group W Westinghouse Broadcasting. And Boston's temperature now down to 68 degrees. The outlook for tonight, cloudy skies and foggy along the coast. Low temperatures in the 60s. Good evening, I'm Ted Larson with the 9 o'clock WBZ News.